Okay, good evening, uh, members and officers, and anyone else who's interested. Um, welcome to this um, Open Scrutiny Committee meeting um, being held, obviously, this evening. Now, um, first thing first, uh, minutes. Do I have your authorisation? as Chairman, to sign the minutes of the meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee held here on the 16th of October 2023 as a correct record of the proceedings. Move. Thank you very much. Apologies and substitution. Oh, I think you that. Right. Apologies and substitutions. We don't actually have any apologies, I don't think. Um, we don't no, have none, any, none received. No, we don't have any substitutes. We just had a rather a large number online, which is unfortunate because we're only just about quarter. Um, so I will start with those remote, but um, our Councillor Barnes, uh, John, Councillor Barnes, Mary, um, Councillor Clark, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Creaser, Councillor Legg, and Councillor Maynard. The rest of us are present, so if we want to know, it's Councillor Colleen, Councillor McCurk, Councillor Cook, myself, and Councillor Burton. We also have a Cabinet Member for Environment and Cabinet Member for more Environment, I assume. Climate change. <laughs> so, welcome. Um, what I will say... Um, from the minutes, basically, on the, um, just for information, you may remember um, last meeting we mentioned the enforcement which Councillor Colleen had, had wanted to bring forward as, a, um, as an item for consideration. And then Councillor Maynard jumped in and said, well, should we have a men member briefing? That member briefing uh, with enforcement officers will take place on the 21st of December. So there's a start there, and depending on the outcome of that, we can then get it on, back on the agenda um, in the new year and see if we need a task and finish group on enforcement. Um, the, you would have all received an email with regard to the task and finish group, which is set up last time with regard to the digital transformation. Um, that's the terms of reference. So if you've all got that, just make sure you're happy with it and reply back to Louise to, to, to say you're happy. And the housing task and finish group, which we've also got set up, a consultant has been uh, appointed very nearly, I believe. And the, work, the first meeting of that group is, will take place hopefully before Christmas with the idea of the week commencing the 18th of December. So if anybody's on that and want to know, there's all the information. Um, item three, additional agenda items, there are none. Item four, disclosure of interest. Anybody in the room got any disclosure of interest they feel they need to make? Probably not, I wouldn't think. Don't know if there's any online. Probably not, but if it comes up. Uh, Councillor Maynard. I'm not sure, Chairman, whether I'd need to declare at this stage, but just to raise your... Um, but just wait your awareness in terms of if anything comes up where East Sussex is discussed, I will have to jump in and declare an interest. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, item 5, performance report, first and second quarters, 2023-24, pages 3 to 14. Um, who's taking this one? That's Anna, of course it is. What do we got? Uh, resolve that Cabinet be requested to agree to that the target for progress uh, progress in all types of plan applications be 80% and over the scrutiny committee consider these findings and recommend any other actions to Cabinet as necessary. Um, what I will say first, I did put it in an email, there is a typo on one of them. I've got to remember which page. Page 7, Environmental Health. Um, quarter 1, it says it's got a, it's got a red... Um, but it's not as bad as that because it quarter one says 51%, which should say 81%. So it's, so it's not it's not mega drastic. <laughs> just just so you're aware. 
Um, Anna, did you want to kick off? Yeah, thank you very much. And apologies for that um, mistake. I don't know how that happened. Uh, so I'm here to present the performance report for the first two quarters of 23 24. Um, so there's a few changes uh, this time. First of all, we're going to concentrate on reporting by exception. So there'll be a narrative in the main body of the report going forward where performance either exceeds or is less than expected. And there'll be um, a commentary from the relevant head of service or service manager. I also wanted to tell you about the uh, performance board that we've established in July. And this is where the senior leadership team meet uh, with all the heads of service and service managers who've got a, a key performance indicator. And we talk about performance across rubber, and we also look in detail um, at area performance and their risks. This has proved very useful, and it's really going to help us identify corporate level risks in rubber, and uh, for us to take any mitigations that are needed if uh, performance isn't where it should be. Um, in terms of the uh, reporting by exception, we've got three exceptions highlighted in the report, two for environmental health and one for revenues and benefits. The service managers, as I said, are, are here and they're going to answer any specific questions you've got if we need any more detail about mitigations for those particular areas. And as you said, Chairman, we're looking uh, for a recommendation to change those two planning key performance indicators to 80%. I think um, members might remember that the committee recommended them to be 80%, but it did get overturned when it went through the governance process. So, um, shall I stop and take questions there, or would you like me to carry on? Carry on, that's all right. So if we look then to the uh, three exception areas, the first one is the percentage of scheduled food inspections that were carried out, and that's in the environmental health area. Um, so this measurement is the number of inspections that were completed, and it's ex expressed as a percentage. The target is 90% completed, but you will see that the first quarter was 81%, and the second quarter 79%. But it's Good to point out that, that by the end of quarter two, there were over 2,000 food premise inspections carried out, which is, is quite a lot of inspections. Um, the other reason that um, performance wasn't where it should be is the introduction of the new iDoc software, which is a massive undertaking, but it was done very successfully, so that impacted on performance. Um, there was also the introduction of the new QR code procedure, and this is where business, businesses can scan the QR codes um, and the online form can be completed. So that is now up and running and it's working very successfully and we should see benefits of that. Coupled with all of that, there were a very high number of applications for new business registrations. Again, on one hand, that is really good news because there are new businesses in the district. And 59 initial food inspections were carried out in that time period. And these inspections aren't scheduled because they're, they're new businesses, so that impacted the, um, the, the, the planned schedule. Uh, eight, and as well as that, 85 complaints were received and investigated about food businesses in this time, and 10 enforcement notices were served. However, um, Richard is here, but um, there, he's not concerned at all about the performance. Um, even with those mitigating factors that we talked about, he's confident that things will improve towards the end of the year. The other one, shall I stop there for any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, Councillor Cook. Thank you. Um, lovely. This is a really, really good report. Um, the 85 complaints, is there a sort of a, an expected time limit to respond to those? And do we have enough staff to complete that? Okay, I'll bring uh, Richard Parker Harding in at this point. Yeah, that's the number of 80, 85 complaints is quite high. Uh, it's not it's normally much higher than we would normally expect. Um, obviously, it's depending really how quickly we respond. It really depends on the nature of the complaint. If it was a complaint, which obviously there's a serious impact on public health, 
then we'd obviously we will investigate within the next few days. Uh, but it was more of a general, more of a wider general complaint, and obviously we'd, we'd inspect within within a few weeks. But if there was a complaint about the rats in the premises, or if there was problems of uh, drainage at the premises, then we, we would ins normally inspect the next day. But just generally within the, within a few days at, at, the, at the most. I also, in terms of staffing, obviously, you no, know, in that. Uh, what we're fortunate at the moment is that we are fully staffed. We have all our staff are fully qualified, and that, that's a, obviously a good thing. Uh, where we have been in recent years, we've always had a few vacancies. Uh, we have been hit by a number of uh, health and safety accidents, uh, which require investigation, which again is unusual. Uh, but obviously we have to give priority to those investigations, particularly when someone has been seriously injured. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Any more? Got any questions? Going on? No? I think what I'll, 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 I'll agree with you there, Anna. The, um, the, the number of food premises inspections at over 2,100 is, is something like, yeah, if you take a working week, that's like 10 a day, which is, you know, is busy, isn't it? And, and then you say, you know, then you've got the sort of new food premises coming on as well, which is sort of unscheduled, which, you know, we can't really complain about, because as you said, that's, that's, that's new business coming into the area. Um, so, that, so that's got to be good. Um, I, I think it's a difficult one. I hope, I hope the team aren't sort of beating themselves up in, 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 with, with sort of perceived failure as it's seen because it because there's a red mark but but i would say the amount of work is 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 massive and and the thing is it this affects it has to be done right and it affects pretty much everybody who lives here uh, and who visits because the, what you want is to go out to a, a pub bar restaurant caf and, and and eat your food hopefully safely so um, you know it affects everybody. So I hope I hope the staff aren't you know aren't sort of down because they they got a red star. But you know I would I would say the work is is, is a massive workload. I don't know if you agree, Councillor Kirk? It's not not a question, just a, a comment, some feedback because um, I, I've spoken to three um, premises owners uh, in in Rye who spoke really highly of their relationship with um, inspectors. And uh, I, I, coincidentally, I was um, happened to be having lunch out somewhere. Um, and uh, an inspector actually was there when I was there. And, um, and that, that, would, that prompted the first comment, you know, uh, so sort of really positive from, from that um, premises owner. So I just wanted to feed that back. Good, thank you. And I think, um, Chairman, it, the um, context is so important, isn't it? Because without that context, you would never know um, the background to this. Um, shall I move on to the next exception? Yeah. So the next exception, again, is, is one for environmental health. And this is the percentage of environmental health service requests completed on time. Um, so with this one, a quarter two is the busiest period for the number of pollution complaints. Uh, it's a pattern that is repeated every year. And during the third quarter, officers should be able to resolve outstanding cases. And half of the cases that, that were not resolved within the target date were resolved within 10 days of this date. So again, I think that's quite positive in the context of the amount of work, as you, as you mentioned, that the team have. Any questions on that one? Let's see, I've got uh, a hand up from the Barnes residence. So whether it's John or Mary, I wouldn't know. John? It's not a question on this, though. Um, I want to comment later on paragraphs 14 and 15 and also raise another point. OK, I'll come back to you then, John. Yep. Yeah, um, and the last exception is revenues and benefits, the average calendar days to process a change to an existing housing benefit claim. Um, current performance isn't within target and could actually dip in quarter three because we're two and a half officers down. However, um, approval has been given 
from the senior leadership team to recruit those officers, so that situation should be resolved. Uh, so there will be exceptions. Okay, thank you. I think, again, on, on the, uh, the housing benefit, I know that um, a few years ago we, we had a massive issue there. Um, and I think it was taking some 40-odd days to, to, to process claims. So, so a, a lot of money was thrown at it, and, um, and, and we've been performing well. So, so as, long as, as long as the team are happy that the new staff coming in to cover that off, because we, we definitely don't want to go back to the bad old days, especially after we spent so many years trying to sort it out and get it, and get it dealt with. Um, John, is this the question you was looking for? Um, let, let me make, um, uh, there are a number of different points I wanted to make. Um, but I agree with you, Paul, on the benefits one. We don't want to slip back, but I understand the shortage of staff. I just wonder if our digital people couldn't look at that to see if there's anything we can do, uh, to actually help the existing staff improve their productivity but that's a, a longer term thought on the two planning kpis so which um there's no reason given for this i accept on 14 that the government is probably setting unrealistic targets when you look across the situation nationally so i'm not too worried about that one but i think it would be great pity if we relax on minor applications, I just wonder if we couldn't phrase it the other way around. Our target should be that we should not drop below 80% uh, rather than set as a kind of upper limit target. In other words, phrase it the other way around. It would send a better signal, I think, to our public. And then while that's being thought about, I just... I had a look at the homelessness targets, given that's now 9% of our budget and a problem. Um, and I, none, none of the three, one we don't actually set a target in at the moment, which is the number of weeks, but none of the three really catch uh, the numbers of homeless we're having to deal with. And I realise actually that is uh, uh, the nub of the problem, but I just wonder whether we shouldn't set uh, some kind of target around what accommodation we are trying to acquire uh, over and beyond uh, the provision we've already made uh, to cope with the increasing number. Um, it's not as if uh, a property once acquired isn't something of an asset. Um, so in in a way, this will be an investment not only in our current problem, but also to some extent in our future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Um, I think we've got a double wank going on here. So we're, we're going to ben, ben will pick up the planning, and I think Joe will probably get the housing bit for you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Councillor Barnes in, in relation to the changes to the planning KPIs. Um, when the, the first paper came forward through overview and scrutiny back earlier in the year, proposing the KPI set, it was set at 80%. That was then overturned at Cabinet. I think what we have to be realistic about at this stage is that that sort of level of performance, particularly in relation to the minor applications, is just not achievable with our current state of, um, particularly in, in, in terms of our, <clears throat> in terms of our uh, uh, digital capabilities within the planning service. Obviously, what we are looking at at the moment is improving that. Um, we're, we're looking at acquiring a new planning software system, which will take time to introduce that with the, with the relevant automation. will improve performance over that period of time. But at the moment, 95% is, is, is an unachievable target, quite frankly, in terms of the minor applications. And therefore, it sort of serves less of a purpose if it's not an achievable target. Um, what I would say is that um, national... Minimal requ minimum requirement is around 60-65% before government are going to start flagging up concerns. So the reason we chose 80% was for that very purpose. It was a baseline minimum of what we would accept performance at. 
and that if it starts dropping below that, then whilst we're still 20% above where the national requirements are, national minimum requirements are, we're saying that our performance is not acceptable. And in particularly in regards to what customers will experience. So I think if you put yourself into the position of a customer, <clears throat> that 80 to 85% range is probably okay. You know, that's where customers aren't going to experience a significant delay in the processing of their planning applications. Um, when it starts to drop below that, I think that's when I would say we are, we are providing poor customer service and we need to address it. So that's why we start, sort of chose that 80% target for now obviously that's iterative and we can change that going forward in years but it's it's unlikely that for the foreseeable future we'll ever meet the 95 percent target on minor applications thank you so so coming back to what councillor barnes said could we set it that we shouldn't drop below 80 is that a, is that a thing that's 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 exactly how it is so as long as we're above 80 percent We'll continue to get a, a, a green tick. If we get close to 80%, then I'm sure we'll get a yellow triangle. And if we drop below 80%, then there'll be a big red blob, and we will have to we will have to seek to address those performance issues. Okay. Um, oh, I'll go, Councillor Cook. Thank you. I mean, I just want to say I'm very concerned about setting targets too high because I think it puts a lot of pressure on our staff. Um, it restricts the amount of time they're able to spend on a planning um, application. Um, and several times lately, um, the planning committee have called things in. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying it is, but it, it does concern me that if somebody is trying to keep to a high target, then, you know, some of these things do slip by the net. So I would absolutely second Councillor Barnes's proposal that it should stay not below 80%. Thank you. Um, Joe, anything to add on the housing question? Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, there, there were a couple, I think. On, on the um, a KPI for demand, that really, I mean, that it's a demand measure, I suppose, the, the level of people we have coming through the door. I know that there's an intention to have an annual state of the district report, which I think it could fit into. It's just, I suppose, the challenge being that it's it's we're trying to focus our performance measures on things the officers can control, or can, can control. and um, that's why we focused on the number of successful prevention and reliefs that are achieved um, to try and, you know, engender a, a greater performance. The challenge we have is that the, as is often the case with housing, that the the causes of homelessness are, are, are myriad and complex. And, and are largely outside of many of which are, are, are outside of our control. So that's that's why there's not a um, demand set in that basket of performance indicators. With regards to property acquisition, we can certainly we do keep track of that to, to assure you um, anecdotally, verbally, we we have a target to achieve 50 properties by the end of the year, which brings us into line with the current complement of uh, capital. Um, investment we've made into that acquisitions program um, and we're on target to reach that number um, acquiring some uh, 15 to 20 properties this year alone so really going well but yeah I, I mean I'm, I'm happy to consider bringing that um, to future scrutiny committees but I understand that the there's a there's a, an intention corporately to keep the performance measures and the basket of measures concise so, I, I, and it's also there'll be a process, I'm sure, in terms of approvals to add uh, performance indicators into the basket in year. So, I, 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 I'm fairly sure, I'm guessing Ben will may, may know more, that would need a council or cabinet approval to, to, to happen. So, certainly it's something we can consider in the uh, in future iterations of the KPI basket, though, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, I think my point was not targeting demand, but whether given the demand, uh, Chairman, uh, we need to raise the target for acquisitions. Now, that probably would require a cabinet decision, but it does seem to me uh, that since it's actually saved our bacon in comparison to Hastings, it would be worth considering and therefore, Cabinet should consider whether we raise the number of acquisitions 
target for this year is currently, as Joe says, I think probably another 15, maybe as many as 20. The question is, uh, should we make that more? How much money you got, Joe? Well, indeed, that's the, there will be. I think it's important to um, thank you, Chair. I think it's important to to um, highlight that we're bringing forward a, a report for more money uh, for consideration to continue with the acquisitions program because we're essentially reaching the end of the authorised capital we've we've spent to date, which has been from council funds some nine million nearly, um, but we've managed to draw in a, about a further three three and a bit million in grants from Homes England. So a total of about 12 million. But we will be coming back. It was planned for December, but it may be January now because of the way the money's falling, basically, to, to make the case for more money, Councillor Barnes. So I'm hoping that will give a, a revised target for, for acquisition and, and the appetite for rate of acquisition can be discussed at that time, I'm sure. Thank you. I assume that answers your question, John. Yes, I'm happy with that. We, we, no doubt when the Cabinet paper comes forward, we can give it support. OK, thank you. Um, anybody else have anything to say on this one? No, are you... Are you oh, oh, Councillor McBurton. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I had a couple of comments, although they're not the key areas, but I think hopefully valuable. Um, one was in relation to the neighbourhood services. And as you note, there have been a very low number of fixed penalty notices for fly tipping. And um, you've acknowledged that. I just It's disappointing, um, but the trend of number of, number of incidents of fly tipping is going down. Um, so I think that'd be great to keep an eye on that because otherwise we, we're not people will carry on to fly tipping if they if nothing happens. Thank you. Um, sorry, I had another comment. Um, I was looking looking forward to this report, and as a new councillor, I found it very useful to see quarter one, quarter two, and. Um, I would say that's valuable and even to roll into the next time, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. So we really establish the trend and we can make valid comments. I, think I would find that helpful. Um, uh, in relation to customer services, um, comparison to similar uh, districts or authorities would be very helpful, as in other areas there is, because... Um, if our, our calls and our inquiries seem substantial, but we might be actually doing pretty well. But if our, if our calls and emails are high, then it, it's telling us the information is not there for our residents. So they phone up because they don't know. So I, I would find that useful um, uh, to hear about that. Um, and final comment is looking forward to the... The categories, um, and I know that's not the matter for tonight, but I think it links in extremely well with the climate strategy where they're indicating what we're aiming for in the future. Cook. Thank you. Looking at Appendix D and the Offlog dashboard, um, it, it, it's a wonderful document, um, but I'm not sure whether that means we're doing well or we're not doing well. Um, so, for example, under waste and recycling, household waste sent for reuse um, in 2021-22, we were at 46.5%. The England median was 41.9%. Are we succeeding or not? Perhaps when we have this next time, it would be... Uh, we, used to get, we used to get little arrows that show whether we should be going up or we should be going down, and a little explanation underneath that said, you know, going up is great or going down is great. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't want an explanation now, but it's a comment. I was, I was just, I was just going to say maybe we could put some little, little red, red, amber, greens against the uh, things. If it's a, if we're doing well compared to the England median, you get a green. If we're doing badly, you get a red. That would be perfect. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> um, 
Anna, is that, is that it? Yeah, that's it. If there's no more questions and no more questions for the service managers present. But yeah, I've noted all those comments and we can definitely rag race it. Good, thank you. Um, well, what I need then, I need someone in this room to, uh, to um, recommend one, that Cabinet be requested to agree with the target of process and all types of plan applications be 80% and hopefully they're listened. And two, over the scrutiny committee, consider these findings which we have done and recommend any other actions to Cabinet as necessary. I don't think we'd necessarily come up with actions to Cabinet, would we? but Anna's got their thoughts on written down, so it'll be good. Councillor McCurk moved. Councillor Killeen seconded. All those in favour? I'd better vote this time because <laughs> there's so few of us. <laughs> That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, officers online. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. Um, moving on. Item six. Revenue a budget capital programme monitoring as at quarter two. Um, this is a report from Duncan. Purpose of the report to note the estimated financial outturn for 23 24 based on expenditure and income for the end of September uh, quarter two, 30 September. Resolved the report, we noted this has been via Cabinet if it looks um, familiar, well, is what I can say. Um, Duncan, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, the, the report hasn't changed substantially since the last quarter. It's, it's got marginally worse in terms of where we were. Um, we were projecting an additional £600,000 overspend this year. Uh, we're now projecting around 700000 so it is, it's slightly worse than the position earlier on in the year. Um, there's some positive news to note within the report, though. Um, we're very successful at drawing down grants and we've got another £128,000 from Sport England to go into the Bexhill Leisure Pool and Rye Swimming Pool, which is really positive. And we have a number of uh, additions and changes to the capital programme that are part of this evening's report. Just in terms of the revenue position, we've got a general fund summary update in Appendix A um, and paragraphs up to uh, paragraph 14 cover the main variances and they build on from quarter one. Um, we were already looking to take around um, £2.2 .2 million from reserves this year, so the additional pressure of 700000 will take that up to around £2.9 million. Um, so that's an ongoing pressure on the reserves that we've spoken about several times at committee previously. Um, we've talked already this evening about the housing pressures and temporary accommodation, um, and that's the most significant pressure in this year's budget. Um, but we're obviously doing a number of positive things to actually try and address and manage that demand led budget. Um, so. Yeah, just, just touching on that for a sec, because I think it's important when we talk about the budget monitoring reports, we can talk about the variances, we can talk about the movements, but I think the most important thing for the committee to recognise and understand and for us to discuss is what we're doing to address those pressures. It's, it's not really enough just to say, well, yes, there is a pressure and it is increasing, but it, it's more important to understand what we can do about it. So Joe and his team have been working in incredibly hard over a number of years. And again, Councillor Barnes touched on it a little while ago in terms of our um, capital acquisition and our programme for purchasing our own properties to use. That's been really, really positive for us as an authority. Um, and it's absolutely helped us, I would suggest, avoid hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds worth of, of cost, because without those 30 plus properties, we would be paying a huge amount um, every day, every week in those additional temporary accommodation costs. And we're still seeing, you know, we can we can see tonight we've got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of additional pressure through temporary accommodation. But it would be much worse if we hadn't made those decisions a number of years ago and if we weren't increasing those properties. Um, so I think that's I think that's really important to recognise there there is only so much we can do. You know, we have a statutory obligation um, in this respect. It is a demand led budget. Uh, so we have to try and manage the, 
the position as best we can. Um, it's a pressure across the southeast. It's a pressure nationally. It's, it's not just here. And obviously with our neighbours, we know that they're under even more pressure. Um, the uh, DLUC or levelling up team have been down to both ourselves and Hastings to do a deep dive recently. Um, and that's twofold, really. That's for central government to better understand some of the pressures we're facing um, but it's also for them to share best practice but I know Joe and Ben and Lorna were involved in those discussions and I suppose one of the positive ways to look at it was that there wasn't any best practice central government could share that we weren't already aware of there weren't any ideas that we we weren't already doing um, on the negative side that means we haven't got any new avenues to explore but having said that, officers will continue to look at all sorts of different things. And the committee will probably remember a few months ago, the housing team brought forward some changes and amendments um, to the, the private sector rental uh, to improve that position. And that's hopefully looking to save £170,000 over a full year. But I think, again, going back to the point Anna made earlier in terms of context, it's important to note that this this budget has tripled over the last four years. So four years ago, it was six hundred thousand pounds. And we're looking at an outturn around two million this year. So that's the size of it over that short space of time. And um, the other positive thing we've been involved in recently is the District Council uh, Network and the LGA put on a session around um temporary accommodation and those pressures. A number of officers joined that meeting online, as did a number of members, um, and we were part of the letter that went to central government to request significant additional funds for next year to try and address some of these challenges. Um, the financial stability programme, you've all heard me talk about that in the past, about the fact that it's, it's not delivering what we wanted it to deliver this year. So those forecasts haven't changed. Again, we're moving to financial resilience in terms of our, our programme for future years. Um, and this is my opportunity just to plug the fact that we have got the budget consultation for next year ongoing at the moment. So there are a number of ideas within that consultation that we're interested in hearing people's views on. Um, and I know we had a, quite a spike of interest over the weekend because we sent out the My Alerts on Friday. So from memory, we've got knocking on for 400 responses now after only a week or two, um, which is by far the highest I think we've ever had. And we've got until the 17th of the December of, of December for that process to continue as well. So that's really positive in terms of that engagement. Um, and we're trying to do things slightly differently this year. We've got some more engaging media and um, we've got some videos, one of which is online now. So Doug's got a video online about the uh, about the position. And we have a, a number of cabinet members that will be coming on to do that over the next few weeks. So that's that's good as well. And just in terms of the capital position, that's paragraphs 14 to 22. And we are trying to provide a bit more detail and a bit more information about the capital program. It, it's still work in progress. It's not where I would like it to be in terms of everything we need to present. But I think it's an improvement from where we where we were. Um, we're projecting to be around 20 million pounds spent by the end of the year compared to the most recent forecast of 28 million. But as you'll all be aware, we are taking a pause. Uh, it's not just about slippage because we can't get contractors or officers haven't got capacity. It is about taking a decision to take a step back, review the position because of all the economic pressures we're under, inflation, interest rates, all of those things we've talked about previously. Um, but that does have a positive effect in terms of our investment income and the amount of cash we have to invest. And obviously, the flip side of that is as well, if we're not borrowing to fund the capital program, we're not incurring interest charges either. So that has helped to offset the delay in delivery from the savings program for this year. Um, just very briefly touching on council tax and business rates collection. Um, we are seeing a very marginally lower collection rate compared with last year. But when I talk about marginally, it's like 0.2 percent for uh, business rates and 0.4 percent from council tax. So that's holding up quite well, given the cost of living crisis that we're going through at the moment. But we will obviously continue to monitor all of that. Um, so in conclusion, it's it's slightly worse than quarter one. 
Um, we're working with the heads of service to try and manage that as best we can. Um, the biggest pressure being the temporary accommodation. And as we've discussed, there are there's only so much we can do. Um, but officers are continuing to progress some of those work streams we've already got in place, like the acquisition programme. But we'll also continue to look at innovative ways of trying to address that. And it's not just about the outcome. It's that's the, the pressure we're facing is at the end of the road. And it's the, the financial cost, but we're looking to see how we can impact positively through the whole chain so that we try and help people prevent um, homelessness in the first place, because obviously that will have a positive impact on the financial position as well. Thank you, Chair. I don't think I need to say anything else on that this evening, but happy to take questions. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Duncan. Um, I think I think it's worth sort of mentioning that as you said, the, the homelessness budget has, has sort of skyrocketed um, from somewhere around 600,000 a year to over 2 million quid, which is probably roughly, off the top of my head, probably 14, 15% of our budget. Um, but as you said, the decisions we've taken as a council over a number of years to, to get our own properties um, if we hadn't have done that, we'd probably be looking at anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of our budget potentially, um, which is where I believe sort of Hastings and Eastbourne and other councils are finding themselves now. Hence this um, this meeting that was held. Um, so we've we've sort of done well, but the, you know it, it's just just as well we have because. And it must be so depressing for staff to continually see a, a line of people turn up at a door um, needing accommodation, possibly for, for reasons beyond their control. And, and it's difficult for us to assist. And, and the thing is, all of us as council taxpayers are, are funding that. And when people say, oh, what about this, what about that? Well, you know, we're funding people, we're having to fund people who... who don't have a house anymore, um, and and that is that's bad news for them, and it's bad news for everybody else. So um, the, the system, you could argue, is busted somewhere. Um, a bit depressing, but there it is. Um, I've got two hands up, so I'll I'll go ladies first. Uh, Councillor Cooper. It's just a quick one, Duncan. Um, in case I missed it, do we know where the hundred thousand pounds? extra that was spent is that due to the housing or do we know where that came from thank you yes there's a there's a number of variances but across across the board to be honest um but it is the majority of the pressures we're facing are from the temporary accommodation side of things yeah councillor barnes your hand is up Yes, uh, I, I'm torn between uh, my admiration uh, for the uh, way in which we're maximising income. I see that's up again, uh, which is useful. Um, and my concern that we're now more than halfway through the year and we're seeing very little sign yet of the financial resilience program uh, beginning to deliver savings. At the moment, we're quite heavily cushioned uh, by this 1.1 million, um, which we're not expending on the capital program. And it'd be rather good to understand from Duncan, I think, how much of that is likely to be halted, uh, in other words, uh, not spent uh, because we're either bringing projects to an end or transferring them into the private sector. Now, that that would have to be an estimate, but it would give us some idea on uh, how serious the problem is getting because we are treating that at the moment as a credit, whereas it's really not a credit unless it's not spent. So um, there's a time factor in all this, which is 
slightly worrying. I am a little more optimistic about at least one element of the financial stability programme, because I think the town council is now going to stand up to the mark. Um, but uh, again, we're not likely to get anywhere like the sum we put into the stability programme. So that deficit is going to remain high. I'm, I'm just looking at the second, well, it's not even the second half of the year, the, the last third of the year, and just wondering how far we're going to get with the financial resilience program uh, to get us back down somewhere closer to the sum we originally budgeted, which was taking two million from reserves, which is already uncomfortably high. Uh, but at least we had uh, budgeted for that. We're, we're now almost uh, a million more than that. And that's pretty uncomfortable as we move towards budgeting for next year um, when we haven't really uh, got anywhere close to uh, the balanced budget, which I think we'd all hope to be in by uh, this time if we go back four or five years. And clearly that hasn't resulted. Not Not Duncan's fault. And indeed, I think Duncan's doing a magnificent job. Um, so forgive my slight pessimism um, and my questions. But I think it is important that uh, we do focus on what we're doing about the problem rather than just the fact that we've identified we've got a problem. And uh, I think the officers are taking steps, but I'm not sure the progress is quite as rapid as some of us might have hoped. Duncan, any responses you feel you need to make? Yeah, there was quite a lot. There's quite a lot in there. So um, just bear with me. I've, I've made a few notes as you were going through, John. Um, just in terms of the interest projections, you'll see from the MTFS that we looked at last month, um, that I'm I'm anticipating that a lot of that income will continue in future years. Now, that's based on a couple of, of assumptions. Um, firstly, it's that the interest rates remain relatively high. Obviously, we've seen inflation drop to 4.6% this month, which potentially could have a an impact on interest rates reducing, but the market isn't showing them coming down particularly quickly and certainly not to the levels we saw prior to the, to the big spike we've had. So while I'm reducing the available income we've got to invest, um, so that is going down, what I would expect from the capital program on the plus side is if we start to spend and continue to invest in those schemes, it will be on the basis that the business case stacks up and either we are making income from them as well as regeneration um, or we're saving money. So that would come back to um, the conversation we were having a little while ago that Joe mentioned in terms of investing in more stock. So that would be on an invest to save basis so that we continue with our acquisition of capital uh, investment in the housing stock because that has a positive impact on the revenue side of things in terms of temporary accommodation. So if the Treasury investments reduce, I'd expect there to be a compensating saving elsewhere in the budget to reflect that. Um, and in some instances, that might be income. Um, so that would uh, that is anticipated to continue. And I factored that into the future forecasts just in terms of the financial stability program, the previous program we've had in place. At the moment, you'll see from the report in front of you this evening that I'm still only projecting around £200,000 from the 1.1 million because I think we need to be realistic about what we can actually deliver from that this year. Um, and my view at the moment is that it, it's not a great deal. Um, like I say, there are some positive compensating factors, the biggest one being exactly what we've just talked about, the Treasury investment income for this year. Um, but that's why we've put the new resilience program in for next year. That's part of the consultation at the moment, but it very much refocuses the conversation. So if you remember me talking to you previously about the fact that devolution was was really the fundamental pillar of, of, of the savings program before. And it's very, very difficult, as we've seen, to deliver um, and to deliver quickly. It can take years and years and years. And then sometimes you still aren't able to do it. So 
in the new program, devolution is at the bottom of the list. It's, it's something we continue to work on. We're having more success with now. And, and in part, that is because we are we're doing what we said we would do. If there are services we can't provide, we are having to reduce them. But that will force people to step up to the mark and consider how they might be able to support with some of those. But we have a number of other work streams um, that are in place. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket for that future um, for that future program, which I think is positive. Um, it's phased over a number of years again to try and deal with some of those timing issues that we we have um, and the negotiations that you have to go through for some of these things. So I think I think, Chair, that's um, that's addressed all of the uh, the points John raised. Thank you. OK, I'll go back to the room now. Uh, Councillor Gurk. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Duncan, there was uh, the, in paragraph 18 in the report, um, it talks about um, 60K in 24-25 and 50K in 25-26 to meet uh, payments for dilapidations at Rye Pool and, and Bexhill Leisure Centre in Pool. Um, and then later on, there's a reference to the, this um, fantastic funding, which rather applied for um, from Sport England of 128K. Um, the sum mentioned in paragraph 18, the 110 over two years, is that funded from Rother's own capital programme? Yeah, and and, uh, and if it is, it yes, is. and um, so that's 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 sort of demonstrates the commitment we've got to those pools, and which is fantastic. And um, I was just wondering if you could explain a bit about what we've done to secure that and the expected impact that that will have on those local resources, the, the you know Rye Pool and Bexhill Pool. Yeah, thank you. Yes, those those elements are from our own capital program um, and they've specifically been set aside to try and address any issues with the repairs and the maintenance and the position of those pools over the next couple of years so that we can try and maintain them at a high level. Um, the we've been yeah really really successful in terms of the the pools funding that we applied to for Sport England that's really really positive over 120,000 pounds of additional funding um, which is really really good um, and just in terms of that we have put in um, a further application so the first round of that was really focused on the revenue running costs of those facilities following the huge spike in energy prices that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and it's quite unusual these days to get much revenue funding. It often tends to be focused around capital. So that was a, a really positive opportunity and a really positive outcome. Phase two is more around the capital side of things um, and trying to invest in some green technology and some energy saving and things like that for the pools. I think the challenges we have around some of our stock are, are the age of the stock, um, which does make that investment uh, difficult. Um, but again, we've put in the application um, we haven't heard back yet as to whether we've been successful and, and we haven't heard from central government when that announcement is likely to be. Um, but I would hope it would be before the end of the, the calendar year. But don't don't quote me on that because I'm not sure what the date is for that. Thank you. I think um, I think there's a couple of things. I think the. The, the closure of the of some of the toilets is is sort of regrettable and is probably a cause of much angst and, and, and bad publicity, if you like, for the council. Um, I wonder what the actual saving is on that. I know we've got to make savings, but I, I just wonder what the actual saving is on that. And, and, and the other one that sort of is sort of close in my patch in, in Eastern Robert Camber is we had a change in places toilet going in to a potential new build or re massive refurbishment in Central Car Park. Uh, see that's been taken out and is now being spent in Bexhill, which is, which is really disappointing, <laughs> except if you're in Bexhill. Um, so, um, but I'm told that 
the further funding will be sought for a changing places um, facility in Campbell. And, and basically, the money's got to be out the door by the end of March anyway, and we haven't even started building it yet. So, so um, I think that's the that's the issue there. I think you confirm that, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. So, um, in relation to the changing places toilets, um, the increasing costs for for those toilets meant that basically we could only afford the one rather than the two as as originally applied for. That's been accepted. That change of project has been accepted by the funding department. The um, in terms of deliverability, it has to be delivered by the end of this financial year. The Campbell Welcome Centre scheme is sort of integrated into the building, and so it is it, reliant upon delivering those building changes, whereas the, the, the Edgerton Park Bexhill Museum scheme is effectively a drop and plug, so you, it's, a, it's a facility that you can buy, and you drop it into the space and you plug it in. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but that's basically the, 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 the gist of it. Um, and, and therefore can be delivered within that time scale. What we wanted to do was make sure that we still provide a facility that maximises the benefit to the community as a whole, and, and therefore um, Edgerton Park and, and the museum sit, seem to feel like the right fit if we weren't able to deliver it at Canberra. Um, that being said, we have got an application in uh, for the Canberra Welcome Centre, which should bring that back into uh, sort of back into the feasibility by, um, and we should understand the outcome of that by the 1st of December. So um, hopefully if that, if that all comes off, then we'll still be able to deliver that facility. It's just not going to be within those time frames. And, and is, how, do, how do I know how much we're saving by closing toilets? Can I ask that question? I'm sure people might know. Um, I think Duncan might have more information on that. I'm not sure. This is me sort of passing, passing over, but I think, I, think, I think we have to be realistic in terms of this financial year. Obviously, there's only three months left. That, um, the savings will be limited. This is about trialling the closure of those facilities, understanding the impact on the community before we make a permanent decision going forward. In terms of the actual savings that could be made this financial year, I think it's actually very limited, but this is about understanding the need of the service going forward. Uh, the needs of the community and how best to deliver those within the constraints of the, the funding that we have. If you want to add anything, Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, that's exactly the position. Um, the saving for this financial year is going to be fairly minimal, uh, but it's about that consultation process we're going through to understand uh, what that impact might be if the proposals are correct in terms of the, the recommended closures that we've put forward. But Chair, just to, just to answer your wider question in terms of the annual budget, um, the direct budget for public convenience is 300,000 and then there's another couple of hundred thousand in terms of support. So from Deborah's team, uh, from um, Deborah's um, oversight as well. Um, so you're looking probably around half a million pounds for that service, which is a discretionary service. So if we were to reduce the numbers by 50 percent high level, you could expect to save around quarter of a million pounds. So it is a significant sum. That's very welcome. Thank you. Um, back online then, Councillor Maynard, you got your hand up. I have, and I've just lowered it. But no, I've only lowered it because uh, you've invited me to speak. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Duncan, for, I think, once again, a very informative and open report. I think that um, we all welcome that across the chamber, whatever political persuasion we are. I think that the the key here is, uh, again, and, and, and I am, I guess, rather irritated by it, that here we are talking about um, making savings, um, when, in fact, from our side of the chamber, we've been talking about this for... Uh, certainly through scrutiny for at least three of the past four years. And, um, we, you know, it, it is a case of, I, I think we are playing catch up when we should have been um, a long way down this, this journey rather than, than once again, you know, consulting and talking about things, frankly, that we should have been doing for a number of years. That said, uh, um, and I'll declare an interest as an East Sussex County Councillor at this point, and you'll understand the context of that as I go forward. And, and that is around, obviously, 
we've historically done some really good joint working and in, in really good um, joint services with with obviously neighbouring districts and boroughs. And we've obviously involved the county council as well in that. Uh, and the joint waste contract historically has been one of those great successes. I mean, the contracts themselves have, have varied in their success, but that they have collectively saved the districts and boroughs a huge amount of money over the years. Um, but going on from that, and, and it's very interesting um, reading the Hastings consultation, because obviously as a, as a neighbouring borough, they are also facing, as we well know, um, some very difficult um, financial uh, backdrop to their budget consultation. But they've been very specific about working um, with neighbouring authorities in terms of, uh, and I, again, I stand to be corrected, um, they have talked about um, up to a million pounds savings by by working, I think, with us and and, and and hopefully others. But I just wanted to be really clear, and I, and I hesitate to put officers on the spot, and I do this in the most positive of, of ways, that, that despite the fact that we're obviously got a live consultation i just want to be reassured that at officer level that you are talking um to and, and engaging with um those that have the same roles in other districts and boroughs and indeed the county council in terms of all of the services that we provide because clearly there is some further work to be done on further shared services in order to make the level of savings we need to make so that we can still provide quality core services, not have to perhaps cut back to the degree that, you know, let's be frank, the alarm bells are ringing. Um, but I think there is significant mileage in, obviously, um, a lot of those shared services are mentioned within the consultation. I just want to be assured that behind the scenes we're already engaging rather than waiting for that consultation response. Thank you, Chairman. Lorna, is that one that you want to cover off? Yes, it is. Thank, thank you, Chair. Absolutely. We've already started some discussion with Hastings. Um, we need to go into these discussions with our eyes wide open and make sure that whatever we choose to share in the future works for other. And um, we're not um, limiting ourselves to discussions with Hastings. We need to look at best practice. If there are shared services that are already working, around the southeast, then we need to be looking at those too. So absolutely, we've started those discussions. And I think, you know, this is going to be a really important part of our financial stability plan or our financial resilience plan going forward. We're being realistic about how long those discussions will take, um, but we have started that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Councillor Barnes, I've got a half of Councillor Barnes there. Um, you want to come back, John? It's Mary, actually, who wants to come in. Um, I just want to ask a little bit about what happened about the Barnhorn Green surgery. I thought they'd had planning permission for some time. So is there some other reason? Because it seems like an awfully long wait uh, for construction to start 24-25. Uh, what has been going on? What's happened? Ben can answer that one. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, the key the key issue is is not one that's unique to Barnhorn or any of the other. It's, it's in fact a, a, an issue across all the surgery developments that have been coming forward, of which there are four in Rother, um, which is uh, the quite simply the revenue funding uh, that's available to pay the rent is not sufficient to cover the cost of build. Um, it's, a, it's a problem that we are working closely, very closely with the ICB, not only on our own project, but um, the, 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 there's, there's two in the, the rural areas and another one in Bexhill as well. So at the moment, the, 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 the project as a whole is on a pause whilst we review the options going forward and how to drive that project forward. It remains a very key project for us in terms of delivering that GP surgery, but we can't put the council at risk by delivering a surgery that's not going to be you know, quite frankly, it's not going to pay for itself. And therefore, we're working closely with the ICB to overcome those hurdles. At the moment, we don't have an answer, but we hope to in the near future. Thank you, Ben. Does that mean that there's a likelihood it won't happen at all? I mean, that would be absolutely disastrous if that happens. So. I, I wouldn't want to say the word likelihood. There's a chance, of course, because until we can overcome some of these hurdles, um, we can't progress the project. That being said, we're reassured that there are avenues 
forward. Um, but I don't want to speculate on those in a public forum until we've had a chance to to, to okay. all the options. But but yeah, I mean, we continue to work as as one of our key priority projects. Continue to work to find ways to overcome the obstacles that have been put in front of us. Well, it's much. No, it's much more important that we actually have enough money or there is enough money to actually progress the uh, development rather than sort of something awful happen halfway through the development. But um, it, it, it does seem a very, very worrying situation if we are actually not able to forecast when that's going to start. Yeah, and as I said, it's not it's not unique to our project. There's there's another central there's a there's a central ward project. Uh, there's one in Roberts Bridge as well, which is suffering the same problems. And it's not unique to our district. It's simply that the cost of build has gone up, yet uh, the NHS budget to facilitate rents has not. So it's um, it, you know if, if you're going to build a, if you're going to build it and it's going to cost three hundred pound a square foot uh, a square meter, sorry to build it. Uh, that's the rent requirement to cover the cost of build and, and, and the rent available is, is, is two thirds of that, then you're not you're not going to be able to build it. So it's it's about what, Thank you. it's about hoping to overcome those those problems as we go forward, working with but, partners and making sure that we uh, we find solutions. But were there industrial units going in as well on that site? It wasn't just the surgery, was it? There were other things going there were other buildings and other uses that that development was going to have. There are, but we appraise the project as a whole, and so it's, it's about making sure, making sure that we bring forward um, all, all elements of that, if possible, or one or the other of the uh, of the elements, if that's all that's possible at this time. But yeah, it's um, it, it's something we continue to monitor. We hope to bring some decisions, uh, some some recommendations to uh, to cabinet in the near future. Okay, uh, Councillor McCurr. Thanks, Chair. Do you mind if I go back to the camber? Changing places, toilet. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm just wondering. You, you were mentioning Ben that um, it, you know one of the considerations was the level of use it would get, and I wonder if we have any um, any uh, data on the amount of visitors at, using Camber or potentially using the changing places toilet at Camber, and those using the um, the toilets at which one was it? Edgerton Park was it moved being moved to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't. It's not. It's not a sort of either or. It's it's that Canberra wasn't wasn't possible just because of the time scales for delivery. So we have to spend the money by thirty first of March. It was we were never going to be able to do that at Canberra, and therefore um, the only reasonable option therefore was to move it to to, to, to the Bexhill option at that point. Thank you. So it wasn't it wasn't a question. Of budget necessarily, it was it was being able to spend the money in the given period of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. So, going continuing with the Edgerton Park changing places um, and the link with the devolvement of public toilets, um, is there provision that that toilet would remain under Rother District Council for servicing etc maintenance has that been thought through because there are significant extra would be significant extra costs to running that facility as I understand it by a user family um, the 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 uh, facility is actually going onto the grounds of the Bexhill Museum so you'll see it from Edgerton Park, but it's actually within the within the leased area of the Bexhill Museum, and they're they're happy to take on those those maintenance. Yeah. Good to hear. I wouldn't like it to be not used to its full potential. Okay, right. Is that it? Is that it? Can we? Are we? Are we happy? Well, I'm going to say we were happy with a two point eight billion overspend, but um, <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Are we happy that the, re the, the report be noted? Um, bearing in mind it has been through Cabinet, um, so we're just looking at it again. We've made our points, I think. So, happy. Moved by Councillor Cook, seconded by Councillor Killeen. All those in favour? Carried unanimously from the room. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Duncan. Um, item 7. Uh, 
Summarise the work of the climate strategy, refresh and provide the climate strategy. Resolve that Cabinet be requested to consider that the draft climate strategy be recommended to Council for uh, approval and adoption. Um, awful lot of work been going into this over the last few years. Uh, Lucy, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this report describes the process that the Council um, has gone through over the last year um, to update the climate strategy, which was previously referred to as the environment strategy. It covers the review of the existing strategy, looks at best practice, um, the increased evidence base, and then covers the strategy development and action planning. The draft climate strategy is presented in Appendix A with the emissions evidence I mentioned in Appendix B and C. The climate strategy builds on the work of the existing environment strategy, taking into account the emissions evidence I just mentioned, alongside changes um, in national policy. The strategy prioritises five action areas, three where emissions are to be reduced, um, and two where emissions can be sequestered or avoided, including nature recovery. Appendix E is the Climate Action Plan, which directs the delivery of this strategy. Um, this action plan takes um, the Council up to the end of financial year 26-27. It is a working document and it includes the actions related to the specific objectives, including KPIs, up to three co-benefits per action, indication of cost, carbon impact, um, ownership of that action and progress to date. The strategy um, is designed to be ambitious but also realistic. It puts the Council in a good position for applying for external funding, which will be required um, with the current financial position. Uh, the strategy will reduce emissions uh, for the council, for its own operational emissions, but also across the district. So it's been designed to help communities in Waldo reduce emissions and build climate resilience. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Field, you've been chairing the, the group. I'm sure you want to add. I have, and to an extent Lucy says some of the things I was going to say, but I wanted to start by thanking you, Chair, for inviting me to be here. I know cabinet members don't come here as of right, but I'm grateful for the invitation so I can listen to the discussion. We must also, I think, all of us thank Lucy for the amazing amount of work which has gone into, onto the, or into this piece of work. Um, it's a real, as she said, building on what we had before, which was the environment strategy. And I think it is worth emphasising that it is now the climate strategy. Um, and also it makes reference to the ecological emergency as well and in that way embraces far more what we've been talking about than the old term environment strategy did. It is also, I hope you'll agree, clear and easy to read, and we have a first climate action plan which takes us up to 26-27. So really positive things to do, very forward-looking, and there has been a lot of engagement with stakeholders, internal and external, in the run-up to this work. So I hope you all have read it. I hope you will all approve it to go to Cabinet, um, and... Again, appreciate all the hard work Lucy has done. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rappo-Nero, you're, you're sat in as well. Anything you wish to add? Just to reiterate, thank you, Chair. Just to reiterate the word that uh, Catherine and Councillor Field just said. Uh, Lucy has worked really hard um, getting this together. And I know she's used the UK 100 and Climate Strategy Guide. I think that's been key to link up to other councils across the country. So we've got a, you know, unifies us against the one target towards net zero. So just really, really pleased and really happy. And thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Anyone in the room? Councillor McCook. Yeah, uh, just to re echo the uh, commendations about the report, um, it's really clear to read, um, which is, uh, is crucial, particularly for something which we want people to engage with um, it's it's understandable it's to the point it's a, it, it's it, it's very practical focused I think one of the things which I really liked about it was the extent of engagement with local groups um, and that means that it's something which is owned by our community which people want to progress to be part of and to really support and I think that's absolutely vital and I count myself amongst that I I I'm very keen to support this in whatever way I can, and I'm sure um, colleagues uh, from across the council will be. Um, one of the things which I uh, want... I had two questions I wanted to ask. 
Um, one was, uh, my main question was really about carbon literacy training and um, how, that, I know we're doing that in Rother, I know that's happening, but I just wonder how ambitious are we being about that? Is that something which is, and I, don't, I genuinely don't know, so I'm, you know, I'm not um, grinding any axes. It's, um, it's something which I, I, I'm really interested in. Um, so how, how comprehensive is that being rolled out in schools? Is it compulsory for council officers, for instance? Um, are we working with other districts and boroughs as well as county um, around promoting carbon literacy? Um, so that was one question. The second question was, uh, given the profile of houses, particularly where I'm from in Rye and Winchelsea, um, are we incentivising planning? Um, I don't know if this is something <coughs> we can do. You know, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's not within our gift. But can we incentivise greener, uh, climate-friendly options for older properties, for instance, um, you saw of insulating render or, or you know, so retrofitting older properties where that's uh, where it's coming through planning committee. Are we are we putting a premium on those uh, those options? Thanks. I, I think on the on the planning thing um, with older buildings, Councillor Kirk, I've, it's something that I've I think the chairman will agree that I've constantly said what what can we do with listed buildings where where you know, I know of people in Rye, uh, and I've worked on a number of listed buildings in Rye, where, where in the winter they literally, you've got a house worth in excess of a million quid, and they're literally living in two rooms, because the rest of it's like a fridge. And, and you, 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 you know, you can't change the windows, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, I've got a colleague, um, and I've done a bit of work out there as well, in Winchelsea, uh, on a house that's being refurbished at the moment. Um, chap's got a plan application in at the moment um, to fit air source heat pumps because it's in listed. He's looking to spend eighty to ninety thousand pounds on air source heat pumps, um, and uh, you know you, you need plan permission because you're going to site them. You know, in the, what, down an alleyway where no one can see. It, it just it just seems sort of. Uh, you know, a disconnect almost. You know, and, and I, I get that you don't want double glazed plastic windows in a conservation area, but you can get really good timber windows that you, you know, you, you can't tell the difference between old and new. And you know, there's some top joineries in, in, in Rover that make this stuff. I fitted it myself. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's they're excellent products. Um, but there's just this thing, what, what can we do in, you know, why can't we have double, you know, minical double glazed or something that's better than a drafty old casement window and you're not allowed to put this in, not and do that, can't do this. It just seems bonkers. To be that's exactly what I was coming from. from. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine. Yes, thank you. I mean, I agree with you, Chair, and I have views about conservation areas and retrofitting um, and the preciousness of some conservation officers. I think a bigger issue then, I think it's one for John or uh, Joe or as big an issue, is how we deal with southern housing um, who own so many of our, our social houses um, and they are their properties and whereas we might, when they used to be ours, the way our council houses have done something about it, they are a massive source of heat leakage um, and unsustainability, especially the older ones. And that is a real nettle we have to grasp somehow, and I don't know how, but perhaps Joe might. Yeah, over to Ben. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right, absolutely. I think, you know, um, Southern Housing own about 3,500 homes within the district, so they are, by, you know, by far and away our biggest landlord. Um, a lot of that stock is old and, you know, not really fit for purpose in terms of a, a modern sort of climate friendly house we are uh, the, the retrofit program is the mainstay of every sort of strategic level meeting we have with them which is sort of monthly or bi-monthly and and it's um, something we stay on top of the simple facts I think can't be avoided is that this is a national problem and quite frankly needs a national solution um, we will continue to work with you know with partners to deliver what we can but unless that 
significant level of funding comes in to help sort of, you know, sort of rocket boost that retrofit program, then it, it, it's always going to be a struggle, and it's going to be done on on what people can, um, what, what organisations can afford to do. It must be obviously noted as well that in, in defence of the RPs, their rents have remained low. I mean, obviously to the benefit of residents who you know who can't afford to pay much more, but. Um, it also means that with building costs going up, retrofit programmes have to take a, a, a back seat. Um, the, the, um, you know, we know that the development programmes have slowed down. I would say that um, in terms of housing, new housing within the local plan, um, climate friendliness or you know, climate awareness at least is, 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 is really central to that. I mean, we... We are limited as to what we can demand over and above Part L regulations under building regs. But where we do have levers to pull in the new, in the new local plan, we are pulling those levers and, and, and sort of really encouraging developments to come forward in a much more sustainable fashion than they would have done before and under the current local plan. So it is a real focus for that. I might let Lucy go on the uh, carbon literacy bit. Yeah, yeah, Lucy, on the carbon literacy bit, I, I actually have done carbon literacy training. It took about eight hours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, oh, sorry. Um, we are rolling out a programme of carbon literacy training to all officers. It's becoming or is mandatory or becoming mandatory. I'm looking at Ben for the nod there. Um, it will take us a while to get there because we're now delivering this in-house. So myself and colleague Elise Manning are, um, are, are delivering this training in, internally now, so it's a considerable saving and makes it much, much quicker to do so. Um, we are taking part in something called um, Carbon Literacy, Carbon Literacy a Action Day, which is coming up at the beginning of next month, where we're going to train a number of officers again, and then there will be an opportunity for members to receive Carbon Literacy training. It's a slightly different toolkit, so these are toolkits that um, we have been given authority to deliver, sorry, from the Carbon Literacy Project. Um, so that does mean to say, though, that we can't then deliver in schools or um, at museums, for example, because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So in order to deliver it in a school, you have to be based in a school, for example, or, or that sort of thing. Um, however, to answer your other question, we have been in discussions with other local authorities to deliver um, to other officers and other members as well at Hastings and at Wildon, potentially, um, which will also help us work towards our gold accreditation as well, which we're aiming for. Councillor Burke. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, I'd say, Lucy, this isn't a report, it's a book. Well done. Um, um, uh, I think it's, my comments are really reinforcing what you have written. Uh, I want, it's ambitious, but we've declared a climate emergency, and there is an emergency. So we, I was looking, thinking about the areas that I think are important for you to focus on, uh, although you've covered a lot, but transport is key in our authority. Um, a third of our emissions come from uh, transport. I think we need to look widely with working with colleagues, particularly with uh, public health, East Sussex County Council, with highways, your active rather, which you mentioned, I think we really need to work on that. Uh, I heard this week an up-to-date stats is 47% of adults over 65 don't do any exercise. And we all know what that spells out if that becomes a habit. And by exercise, I mean 150 minutes per week. It's not a lot. Um, the other area I think is again, important, and you know this, uh, is the scope three emissions. You know, that's 90% in Rother District Council's emissions. So we've got the, cheap, the two main areas are our leisure centres and waste contract. And I know that people, officers are looking at that, councillors are looking at that, but I think really, really strong emphasis on that. Um, I support for Towns and parishes is also important uh, because that's how we spread the word to our communities because they're much nearer to their councils as against Rother is not so near for contact for 
campaign to change for awareness. So I would emphasise that, maybe ask for a little bit more than that's in the report. And finally, I bring up uh, two questions, really. It's ambitious. Um, what, how do you, do you see the difficulties, either financial or otherwise, for implementing the action plan? Uh, um, because at the moment, it's a, to spread the word is, is significantly demanding. And the other comment is about maybe we need a separate report to look at plans for mitigating the effects of climate change that we're already having. We're higher temperatures in the summer, we're getting flooding, so that it's about, it's already with us, climate change, and thinking about that for our district. Please. Yeah, happy to take those. So in terms of financial, um, the financial side of things, so this, this action plan has been written with the current financial situation in mind. So um, a number of the actions that you see in there, we've already secured funding for. Um, for example, the shared prosperity funding to deliver the business um, actions within there. Um, some of it will require additional funding as well, and I've we've specifically written the strategy in mind to have those hooks in there. So when central government funding or, or elsewhere funding pots appear, we have got those hooks back to the strategy that we're able to apply for, for that funding. Um, but yes, it, of course, it, it, the amount of work that is done is, is dependent on the amount of finance available. Yeah. Um, in terms on the report, I think you mean an adaptation report rather than a mitigation report um, um, in terms of how we deal with the, the impacts that are already happening, essentially. Um, so this report, uh, so um, yes, absolutely happy to do something similar or something like that. I know East Sussex are starting to have discussions about um, what does it look like for adaptation um, for, for the county. Um, central government also has um, some, some initiatives coming out that we have expressed an interest in engaging with um, to, uh, to, look at, to look at adaptation further. Thank you. That shows the importance of your carbon literacy training. The terminology is actually quite hard, um, but thank you for getting me right there. And I look forward to the exciting, uh, this time maybe next year when we get an update, which will be very exciting to hear about. Thank you. I've got a couple of uh, hands up online now, so I'll go to Councillor Barnes first. Councillor Barnes. Chairman, I only wish to declare an interest. That was all. Bearing in mind that East Sussex has been brought up. Sorry for jumping in, but it's the right thing to do, I think, given the context of the conversation. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> OK, it looks like Councillor Field wants to do the same, just in case. And probably uh, Councillor Clark as well, if he's still there. Um, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I'm torn with admiration. Uh, because I think there's an enormous amount of work gone into this and there's an enormous amount of useful information. But somehow, for me, the strategy is still struggling uh, to get out. Um, it, it almost gets lost in the detail. And I'm just wondering, um, I, I realise we have limited resources and that's true of uh, office time as well. Uh, but I approached this looking at it, how are we going to operationalize this and how are we going to measure? We've got three distinct areas. Uh, one, things we can directly control or influence. Uh, those which we can only influence by working through our partners. And the last one, which is purely suasive, although it's not unimportant, um, particularly when you look at the housing sector and the particular patterns of tenure. And yet that is a pretty major problem for us because our direct influence uh, will only really be exercised uh, through the new local plan and through anything we can do uh, by way of building regulations. And uh, I suspect building regulations are a pretty imperfect tool at the moment. Um, so when I looked at that, I, I wasn't quite clear uh, what 
the priorities and in the first stage are going to be, and then what were these subsequent stages were, roughly how long we thought they were going to take, and what sort of degree of progress we were going to make towards our target. Um, when I looked at it through those eyes, I, I confess I thought uh, this is still work in progress uh, rather than a finished strategy. Um, very valuable, uh, but I, I have to say, um, if I were looking at it, uh, asking what our immediate objectives are, I would find it very difficult to tease out. Um, the There are one or two areas, too, which I think are simply missing. Um, there's no mention. We, we mention electric vehicles the whole time, but we know that hydrogen is going to have to play a major part, certainly in all the heavy vehicles and buses. And we obviously are going to have some control over the waste collection uh, side of things because we sit on the waste authority. Um, their hydrogen is going to be the answer rather than electric. And I suspect, too, at the moment, given the pressures on the national grid, if hydrogen doesn't take part of the burden, at least in meeting the need for vehicles, uh, even for ordinary households, uh, we're going to be in problems. I think electric bikes may play a part in rural areas, but I suspect over roughly half our population and uh, a lot more of our area, uh, the car is going to remain essential, and therefore how we actually manage to make those cars, cars much more climate friendly and faster. It's going to be much easier done in the urban areas, and yet it's the rural areas which are going to be our big problem. I welcome particularly, um, however, the recognition that the AOMB is rather special in terms of landscape. But even within that, there are going to be areas which we can regenerate to absorb more carbon. I think we need to understand better what else absorbs carbon uh, than trees. Hedges, I'm told, are particularly good. Um, peat bogs, but I don't think we've got many of those. Um, but it would be good to understand a little more uh, what we can do through planning uh, to actually influence that. Um, but I've got still got more questions than answers, I'm afraid. Chairman, I apologize for that because I do recognize it, the enormous amount of work uh, that Louise and her colleague have put in and the valuable information here. But if we can somehow uh, get out of the marble, uh, the a more finished program of work, I think that would look more like a strategy than this document does at the moment. I'm sorry to be critical, uh, but it's right that at overview and scrutiny, we do actually voice our criticisms. Right. Um, ben. Um, I think to a degree, uh, Councillor Barnes has, has sort of answered his own question in so much as the, the, the second question answers the first question. You know, there are things missing from this strategy. There are bits that, and you know, under the five different objectives, we could have had a multitude of different outputs. I think what the strategy sought to do is really focus that down on things that we can either directly influence or indirectly influence, but with a degree of certainty. So I think, you know, and, you know, in, it, I mean, you mentioned um, sort of electric cars and, and hydrogen and things like that. I mean, I think they all fall under the, 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 the low to zero carbon uh, vehicles across the district. There's a lot that's not included in this strategy, and I think that's where the strategy lies, is, is what has been included. Where can we focus our energies? And those, you know, those three or four out, those two or three outputs per objective are really where we're looking to focus our, our energy and resources. We recognise that as a council, as a local authority, our impacts 
um, our ability to influence this is, is, is limited, and therefore we need to operate in, with, you know, within the maximum capacity that we have. Where can we most affect change? And I think the objectives and the outputs that sit underneath them have, uh, have articulated that in the best possible way at this stage. You are right. This, it's always going to be a work in progress. I think the Climate Change Steering Group and, and, and Lucy would agree that this is a living document. This is something that needs to be adapted and amended as we go forward. It needs to adapt and amend with the new evidence that comes forward and with new technologies. And as those opportunities arise, we'll seek to, we'll seek to include them within that. But I, I, have, I have to say, I think in terms of the, the objectives that have been articulated and the, potential, and, and the prioritised outputs under those, that's probably, I think, the, very, the upper limit of what a council with our resources and influence could achieve and it's therefore a very um, uh, ambitious strategy, but it, it, is, it is strategic in its nature. Thank you. Catherine, you wanted to say something as well. Well, I did, because we know, because we've been discussing scope one, two, and three emissions since 2019, that as you get up higher up the numbers, it gets progressively more and more difficult to have any effect, and we know that the waste contract, well, we don't know. I hope the waste contract will solve a lot of our scope three emissions issues by changing the fuel of the refuse collection vehicles. But I think any strategy has to be seen in context, and the context is the huge mountain of action plans which underpin it. And it will be those action plans, I think, which will answer a lot of Councillor Barnes's concerns. Plus, you, uh, Mr Hook mentioned the Climate Change Steering Group, which, as you know, um, is a very practical committee which monitors the work of this as well as the action plans. So... Yes, there are about to be things which we didn't cover as thoroughly as some might want. But, as Mr Hook said, we have to operate within the bounds of our resources. And I, I think this is a very, very effective strategy. And I think the action plans will demonstrate that it will work. Thank you. I think it's worth mentioning that, for those who don't know, the building rigs uh, have come in, have, have been massively updated um, they were updated last year. It's actually coming, I think, from the first or the middle of June sometime. Any new starts, insulation levels have been increased quite substantially um, and, and, and other sort of, um, you know, changes to, to building fabric. Um, and the regs have, have been... And, and you've now got to have, uh, even for, an, I, think, I believe, an extension, you, you have to put in a... a um, electric vehicle charging point. Um, so there it is. Um, so changes have been made there. Um, I've now forgotten the other thing I was going to say. So, so <laughs> that's probably just an age-related issue. Um, I could say I'm sitting here quite smug. Um, my, my house is uh, EPC of A, one of the very few... Uh, and, and my bicycle, which has zero emissions, uh, uh, covered 154 miles last week, uh, which was about eight times more than my van whilst I was going to work. So, um, so there it is. Um, <laughs> so, um, I've got no Council Council Maynard's hand has gone down, so that's good. And I've got uh, is is Council Barnes's hand a uh, historic hand or a fresh hand? <laughs> just wanted to come back I, I'm truly appreciative of the amount of uh, work that's gone into this I just think given the limits of um, finance that we've got um, given actually the limits of officer time we've got um, I was trying to pull out what are the most effective means and what will be our priorities over the next uh, couple of years um, because that's really what I would hope the strategy would point us to. Catherine seems to be saying well that will all be in the action plan. I, I think strategy has got to be a guide to an action plan and to the priorities and where we're going to put our limited budget and our limited resource of officer time. I'm not sure the guidance is quite as clear as I would have hoped. I think, 
I think it's a difficult one. We, as Ben said, we can only, you know, direct action could be, do we spend £300,000 on, on biofuel um, to, to put in the refuse trucks, which would reduce our sort of emissions by probably 85%. Do we do that? Well, if you Duncan's probably just fell off his chair um, because he's got a 2.9 million deficit and he probably doesn't want it to be 3.2 million because we want to spend 300 grand on possible biofuels. But so your question there, Chairman, is should be the number of uh, the amount of emissions over what period of years because when you're trying to prioritise, uh, you need to know that's obviously an immediate saving, but it doesn't necessarily buy you a lot of years because you're going to replace the fleet. Yeah, well, I think, I think what the, the, from what I understand, the plan going forward, when you have new contracts, like say, say, the, say the grounds maintenance contract, we could, we could easily, into the new grounds maintenance contract, say uh, we don't want petrol streamers, we don't want petrol chainsaws, we need powered, powered, uh, battery-powered tools, which are coming on, which are much better than they were. We can use those. That's, that's a small win for us. Same with, um, you know, should we, should we go down the fact that if we're giving staff members who drive around the district, you know, money to, to run their own cars... Should we say to them, here's your, your vehicle allowance, which will, you know, you've got to buy, buy an electric motor, mate. Um, end off. Um, you know, should, is, is that what we do? Or do we have, as, as Robin Venard said years ago, do we just have half a dozen um, you know, Renault Zoes in the, in the backyard plugged into, a, in, plugged into the grid um, for the... For the you know, the planning bloke or the environmental health staff to, to jump in and, and go out and drive around the district doing zero emissions in our vehicle as opposed to paying paying them to use their own vehicle. But then they might then say, well, hang about, I can't afford my own car because I'm not used, I'm not getting paid for the mileage. So it, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think the report, or, or I think this, this, this strategy uh, is a good start. We all would agree that there's a, there's a ton of work which, which Lucy and Elise have been doing. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of unhappy to, to sort of rip it apart or, or, or criticise when, when so much has gone into it. This is being recommended to Cabinet, which will then go to Council. So, you know, Council is, is, is where, you know, I know... Uh, the officers won't be there to, to answer questions, and hopefully at council we can approve it. But I would I would hope that we've got sufficient information here, um, and 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 we're realistic. You know, there's there's things that we can do as a council in 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 in, in what we do and how we try and encourage people, um, and I think that's all we can do. We 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 can't force someone to to buy. A, hydrogen van because they don't exist um, equally you know do you buy an electric van which you know if you buy a diesel van it costs you 25,000 quid if you buy a, a, a electric van it's going to cost you 65,000 quid and you can't afford to buy the plastic thing so you know is that you know we, that's not our I don't think that's our remit um, but we can encourage um, what we can and if that's through, through, through building regs or if that's through our, our contracts that we let for people work, you know, working for us, if that's via our staff who drive around a district and use a more environmentally friendly vehicle, um, then I think that's as far as we can go. And if we get some better, better things come out of it in the meantime, then, then good. But I hope we agree to that. Councillor Kirk? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I absolutely agree, and I think that goes to the heart of a lot of the difficulties that ordinary folk will experience uh, in trying to be greener and more sustainable. Um, some of us can afford electric cars, some of us can't. Um, but I think what goes to the heart of, and I think this is where the report uh, comes into its own, because remembering it is a strategy. It's not an operations plan. It's not an implementation plan. It's a strategy and it sets the ambition. And I think it's a really important 
uh, ambition. I know we all agree about that. But it comes down to a mixture of national government, of uh, districts and boroughs, council, uh, county, uh, and also parish and town councils to figure out how we implement this in a realistic way with our communities. And what, what, I, was, what I mentioned earlier on was the level of engagement evident in the report uh, with local community groups, which is absolutely vital. People are desperate to contribute and have a direction to, to, to be set, to take part in, to get behind at the local level, um, to make a difference to climate, to, to try and adapt, to um, do what they can. To, and, and as a, for instance, mentioning um, electric vans, we've got a scheme in Rye um, set up by a, 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 a chap who's been instrumental you know, in, in a lot of change locally around enhancing knowledge of, of climate and the importance of climate, um, who got a great, got an um, electric van partly via a grant from Rother Council. And what he does with that van is to go around and collect um, uh, composting materials. He's, he's unbelievably knowledgeable and... Um, fantastic at creating compost of every conceivable kind. Um, you know, he collects coffee grinds from our local cafes. Can I mention his name? Sure. Graham Ellis. I think he's a hero. You know, a uh, community hero. Uh, so that, that's one um, uh, example of, of something which is happening locally and which people are desperate to be part of and which th this strategy will, um, will really contribute to uh, so uh, that for me is, is vital but I think you know it, 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 just to go back to the need for parish councils, town councils ourselves, count, uh, council, county even uh, to work together to make our communities places where cars are less and less necessary where bikes and walking uh, as Councillor Burton was talking about the need for exercise in so many ways whether it's uh, carbon uh, re reduction or being healthier in the future, um, are goals which are m much more easily achievable. In, paradoxically, in our rural communities, it can sometimes be more difficult to do that because you know walking along a country road, particularly at night, is not straightforward. Um, so that that for me it goes to the heart of, of what this. Um, what the, the difficulties in implementing this will be, but are they real opportunities in making the strategy real? Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you. It's lovely to hear you being so positive, um, Councillor McCurk. It really, really is. Um, I also wanted to be really positive. I don't think there can be a single person, resident in our district that isn't aware of the emergency emerging with the ecological situation we're in at the moment, especially with all this rain and flooding. Um, I wonder if some people say, well, I, I want to do something. I really, really want to do something, but I don't know where to start. And I'm thinking a lot of this strategy talks about, um, or the action plan rather, talks about objectives to repair, reuse and recycle goods and materials. It talks about planning. It talks about retrofitting. But if people ring us up and say, I really want to replace my windows. I don't particularly want to use plastic, but I don't know where to go. Could we, as members, encourage anybody in our areas, our parishes, our towns, or within our own experiences, encourage people who have a green answer to timber window frames, collecting coffee grounds to make uh, compost, and to build some kind of green directory? Not that we actually want to create it, but that then if people come to us and say, this is what I want to do, we could say, well, actually, there is a timber-framed double-glazing window maker in the area. And then people are going to be then feeling that they're making a positive contribution. Um, and the word will get around. I think it really is ground roots. It's up to us members to spread the word about this and to, and to seek people who are making real contributions. So thank you. And please congratulate Graham Ellis on our, all our behalves. <laughs> Other than that, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to move that we accept this strategy and take it to Cabinet. Okay, and a second one? Councillor Burke. Um, ben, did you want to say something? 
Lucy, are you done? Just about, she said. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Councillor Creaser, you've been quiet. Now's your chance. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I have to say that uh, because we are here in Rye, very much part of the rural community, we have a lot of poverty. So a lot of the um, savings would be for people other than those who really are quite poor. And it, it is um, behoving to all of us who are better off to ensure they have the opportunity to join in this initiative um, when you think about people who've got oil and other forms of heating and stuff like that, it is really hard for them. Um, and also the connectivity between the people in the rural communities and the rest of our society is pretty grim. Um, so I think we need to really look at that and to encourage um, those of us who are better off to actually work with those of us who struggle. And they're not struggling because they're lazy or any of that stuff. It's simply their location. If you live in the middle of nowhere, um, it's a real struggle. And, and if you were living in the middle of a town, that same person would be considerably more comfortably off. So I think we need to really think about the differing... Um, dynamics of people within our community so we need to not forget that so thank you thank you right um it's been moved and seconded um all those in favor that's all five of us that's carried thank you very much um thanks lucy thanks catherine thank you. um last item item eight work program 2011 is done. Um, 2201, oh, it's next year. Um, draft revenue budget proposals, key performance targets, allocations policy. I think there's enough to be going on with there. Uh, draft local plan consultation in February. That's probably enough as well. March, crime disorder committee, receive report from the community safety partnership, which is usually rather long. Uh, performance report and revenue budget uh, capital programming, so I think there's enough on that one. And then in April, called in emergency procedures, draft annual report to council, which is quite easy. Uh, review of progress against the recommendations of the Health and Wellbeing Task Force, Task and Finish Group. Uh, report of digital customer um, services, Task and Finish Group, and impact of Airbnb, second homes in Rye, Winchester, and Canberra. So it's probably enough to be getting on with. <laughs> So if you're happy with that, we, we leave that as is. And it, because and obviously there's a potential there given the... When was it, Louise? 21st December, they plan the enforcement. Um, so somewhere we may even have to find space for, for a, another task and finish group looking at plan enforcement. But we're, we're waiting until after Christmas, I think. <laughs> um, so if everybody's happy with that, I will declare the meeting closed at 2025. Thank you very much for your attendance.